When I first started writing letters to elected officials, I didn't think of myself as lobbying. After all, aren't lobbyists, those rich guys in fancy suits, often former congressmen themselves, who use their personal connections to influence policies that benefit the rich? Actually, the definition of lobbying does include regular citizens like me who try to influence the decisions of their government. Originally, these influence efforts occurred in the lobby outside the room where the bills were voted on, hence the name lobbyists. Today, labor unions, environmental organizations, cities wanting to influence state or federal policy, private businesses, as well as ordinary citizens all participate in lobbying. I like to think of advocacy in terms of quality and quantity. Some of my fellow advocates have ongoing relationships with elected officials who trust them and look to them for expertise. The relationships take time but can have an impressive influence on policy. Accompanying such time-intensive quality lobbying, but more accessible to people with busy work lives, are lobbying strategies that depend on quantity. It doesn't take long to send a letter to Congress, and the websites of environmental organizations often have pre-written letters asking you to sign on. So environmental organizations can mobilize hundreds of people and other organizations to sign on to advocacy letters. Technology can help generate more letters in an even shorter time. With the Climate Action Now app, I don't have to fill out my name and address each time I sign on to a letter. Because I've registered my address in the app, all I do is click on a letter and it automatically adds my signature and gets sent to my elected official. The official staff receives maybe thousands of letters each day. Instead of reading them, they simply record the issue and position pro or con of the senders. I was told that they are even starting to use AI to tabulate the volume of letters that they receive. Elected representatives are influenced both by long-term quality relationships and by the quantity of letters about an issue. In real life, there is a continuum between quality and quantity lobbying. In December 2023, I helped organize an action party to influence climate provisions in the U.S. Farm Bill. Action parties are hosted by Climate Action Now and entail experts speaking about a particular issue followed by participants sending hundreds, if not thousands, of messages to public officials using the phone app. The focus is on quantity, lots of letters. But after the Farm Bill Action Party, one of the speakers asked if I could help coordinate a Farm Bill virtual fly-in. Instead of flying in to Washington, D.C. for meetings with legislators, climate experts and local constituents met with congressional staffers via Zoom. The hope is that such meetings will not only influence immediate Farm Bill policy, but also foster ongoing relationships between elected officials and climate advocates. Although it can be a lot of work to set up a meeting with a congressional offer, office, the staffers are generally open to the information we share and don't retaliate if the information conflicts with the views of their elected official boss. Lobbying is part of the U.S. tradition of participatory democracy. But what about countries without such a tradition? It turns out that lobbying by citizens groups is also prevalent in China, and in some cases welcomed by the government. In one study, nearly 70% of Chinese NGOs reported they had access to policymakers, often on a weekly or monthly basis. Emphasizing the importance of connections in gaining access to policymakers, one NGO leader said, it is crucial to know the right person who might care about the issue and is willing to share the position with other representatives. We sometimes provide them with our policy proposals before the sessions of the Congress and the representatives then present the proposal at the Congress. Similar to other countries, such access to policymakers in China is generally based on ongoing relationships that build trust and on shared values. So what were the policymakers looking for from the citizens groups in China? Perhaps not that different from what they were looking for in the U.S. Because environmental issues are complex, policymakers may lack the expertise to come up with solutions and thus depend on the in-depth knowledge offered by citizens groups. Of course, NGOs can also help policymakers feel the pulse of civil society regarding a particular issues. In addition to communicating directly with policymakers, 
Chinese and U.S. NGOs realize they need to indirectly influence policymakers through influencing public opinion. As one Chinese NGO leader put it, achievements are mainly made through creating the turbulences, that is, by activating the public around particular issues. Often this is done through the media and social media. Of course, citizens are not the only lobbyists. The business community is also heavily engaged in lobbying. But this doesn't mean that environmental lobbyists can't be influential. My Climate Action Now colleagues organized an action party focused on the birds and the bees bill to restrict the use of neonicotinoid pesticides in New York State. Whereas the bill had passed the legislature, the governor was hesitating to sign it, likely because the farm lobby opposed it. We sent over 2,000 letters in one hour to the governor and others who might pressure the governor to sign the bill. Shortly thereafter, she signed the bill. We don't know for sure that our quantity lobbying made a difference, but likely our efforts played a role.